I'd like to thank Sages as well as Doctors Nguyen and Ali for the opportunity to present our research. I have nothing to disclose. The aims of our study were to measure the incidence of postoperative bleeding after a standardized laparoscopic gastric bypass, as well as describe the management and outcomes of patients with bleeding complications. Our design was a retrospective bi-institutional review, including two fellowship trained surgeons trained by the same mentor. And all patients in the study underwent the same operative technique with the ex one exception, which was one institution used exclusively Covidian staplers while the other used exclusively Ethicon. Our te technique was an anti-colic, anti-gastric, Y gastric bypass. Our gastrojejunostomy was created with a linear stapler technique utilizing blue loads. And our jejunojejunostomy was created, um, <clears throat> and a common enterotomy was closed with a stapler utilize, utilizing white loads. No buttressing materials or biologic glues were used. Our inclusion criteria were all patients who underwent a primary lap gastric bypass between the years of 2003 and 2006. And our exclusion criteria were patients that refused blood transfusions based on personal beliefs. Our study group included all patients who received a transfusion for acute blood loss in the post-operative period. And blood transfusion was given when a patient presented with tachycardia, oligoria, orthostasis, or an acute drop in hematocrit below 21%. A univariate analysis as well as a multivariate analysis was used to identify predictors of postoperative blood transfusion requirements. And our predictor variables that were examined were initial BMI, age, institution, which was confounded with surgeon as well as stapler type, and gender. 3,054 patients uh, were included in our study. 81% of these patients were female. Our mean initial BMI was 47.7, and our mean age was 44.6 years old. 33 of these 3,054 patients were identified as having a bleeding event in the post-op period. There were no 30-day deaths, and our leak, weight, leak rate was 0.1%. There were three locations of hemorrhage in our study, gastrointestinal bleeding in 18 patients, subcutaneous bleeding in one patient, and intraperitoneal bleeding in 15 patients. And bleeding was identified at a median of one day post-operatively. Nine of the 33 patients that were identified as having a postoperative bleeding event underwent a re-exploration laparoscopically. Two of these re-explorations were therapeutic and identified active bleeding from the mesentery, and, which was controlled, and seven were found to have no active bleeding. A univariate analysis showed that patients that required blood transfusions were significantly younger than those that did not require blood transfusions. And a multivariate logistic regression with initial BMI, gender, and institution controlled showed that decreasing age was a predictor for postoperative blood transfusion requirements. So some conclusions. Transfusion events occur in approximately 1% of our patients. Younger patients may have a higher chance for bleeding. Operative intervention rarely was beneficial. And stapler type may not influence incidence of bleeding. Two other thoughts are pro progressive tachycardia in the first 12 hours after surgery is often secondary to bleeding despite an early normal hematocrit, and aggressive resuscitation and early recognition of bleeding is critical to positive outcomes. Thank you very much. Questions? This paper is open discussion. The first question is, um, uh, there's uh, staple line reinforcement that's out there, and there's been randomized study demonstrated reduction in uh, the incidence of hemorrhage after gastric bypass. Um, why are you not using the buttress material? Um, it's generally the practice of the, uh, the tendings that I work with that we did not, that they chose not to. Um, and our bleeding rate has been relatively low. Obviously we can't say that buttress materials are not necessary because our incidence of bleeding was not high enough to, uh, do some type of a, a trial study on that. Actually, a large randomized trial would have to be undertaken to say that. And, um, you know, in our patient population, with our bleeding instance, it doesn't seem to be necessary, but obviously that's just our patient population. Right. Normally, you use a preventive measure for a high incident problem or a small incident problem that can have a lot of uh, complications associated with meaning mortality. And bleeding is definitely a life-threatening condition. So, uh, first question. Two questions. Your bleeding, I thought that all of this bleeding usually are intraluminal. That was in you know, my experience in reading uh, some other literature. 
uh, you had high incidence of peritoneal bleed, hemoperitoneum, I think you quoted 45%. Can you tell us where was this bleeding from? And the second question I have is whether you had any of these bleedings presenting as a bowel obstruction requiring reoperation. So in other words, whether obstruction by the clot was more detrimental than the bleeding itself. So to answer your first question, uh, in the intraperitoneal bleeding, most of the bleeding was from um, the mesentery, sometimes at the staple line, not at the, uh, at the anastomosis, but when the stapler was fired, there was some bleeding from the staple line of the, of the uh, mesentery. Uh, the other bleeding that was found was generally off of the omentum. We divide the omentum with harmonic scalpel in order to lay our um, uh, jejunum up to bring up to do our gastrojejunostomy so it lays appropriately to prevent obstruction. Um, Really, in general, most of the bleeding in the patients that we've uh, included in the study tended to stop without intervention, um, just with aggressive resuscitation. And in those two patients that we did re-explore that had bleeding, it was a small, slow ooze from the mesentery, which was easily controlled. So um, in those cases, it appears that it was just from the staple line of the mesentery. Dr. Fishman, do you use uh, any pharmacotherapy for DVT prophylaxis? We do. We, everyone gets um, subcutaneous Lovenox in the immediate post-op period, usually within the first six hours post-operatively or the post-op day zero overnight. Um, and they remain on Lovenox in the uh, post-operative period until they're discharged. The high-risk patients who have either a history of um, a DVT or a pulmonary embolus obviously remain on um, prophylaxis post-operatively and until follow-up in the office. But most patients generally stay on Lovenox while in the hospital and then are not sent home on, on Lovenox. Are you also giving that uh, in the preoperative setting? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Dr. Matar? Uh, I have two questions, really. One is, you know, the majority of your bleeding patients were non-surgical in nature, uh, right? And so uh, I've noticed that when I've had a more prolonged operation, usually due to excessive ooze from patients, and as you know, you know, in spite of our uh, recommendations that they stop NSAIDs and uh, other aspirin and so on. Some of them continue to do it or have a prolonged effect. Um, I would have liked to know that uh, whether there was a correlation between the duration of surgery, of, 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 oper of operative time, and the incidence of bleeding. And th the second thing I'd be interested to know is, um, uh, did you have any incidence of pulmonary embolism in patients who, re who received blood transfusions? So um, <clears throat> there was no significant difference in time in patients who presented with the um, post-op bleeding event. Um, and we, in, in the patients including this study, there was no instance of pulmonary embolism in the patient group. Dr. Felix? If, if I understand you correctly, these are all the patients were transfused. What determined which patients were re-explored? What was your uh, method of deciding who got re-explored and who got just transfused? So, in the immediate post-operative period, patients who are tachycardic, um, obviously with the, with the oligoria or orthostasis, we generally tried to aggressively resuscitate them with IV fluids or blood products. Um, once the patient became persistently hypotensive or the hypotensive progressively worsened, that was the time where we made the decision to take the patient to the operating room. The patients weren't necessarily standardized. Each one was, you know, decision to reoperate was based on their clinical signs, presentations, um, none of them had, some of them had blood parectum, uh, the intraluminal bleeds had blood parectum, and if the, in, in, in the amount of blood that was passed or the interval between the bloody bowel wounds increased, that's when the decision was made to take them back to the operating room. For the other patients, it was persistent tachycardia that did not resolve with aggressive resuscitation, at which point the decision was made to take them back. Yeah. Last, uh, all the DVT trials to date are really using a preoptive dose of uh, thromboprophylaxis. So if you're going to use, you know, thromboprophylaxis, it's, you have to use the preoptive dose, not just a postoperative dosage. Okay, thank you.